To live a life of purpose is to really desire to know why you're here, why you exist. And God has created us. We are wonderfully made. To, to know your purpose is to have a sense that you are here, placed by God, to do something that only you can do. And for the Christian, that is connected to transforming lives. There's nothing more joyful than, than having that purpose of, I can be a blessing to everyone that I meet, I can share the good news in winsome ways, and even, even be a part of, of bringing unity uh, to, to churches in my city. Whatever gifts God's given you, you can live it, it, uh, in a purposeful way as you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, I think meaning comes from knowing who we are in Christ, what Christ has done for us, and walking in light of that reality that's both, well, new life and eternal life. He knew us before we were formed in our womb, and He knew what our purpose was supposed to be. In order for us to really fulfill that, we need to ask God, believe God, and walk in that. I'm like, God, how can I use what you've given me uh, to show that I love you and to bless and, and serve and, and lead others to faith as well? And that sums it all up pretty much. All the rest, uh, I think, are, are byproducts from that. Well, like Pastor Sean said, uh, when we live lives, if you're a follower of Jesus, we should be thankful every day and aware of God's, God's goodness every day. But there's something special about this time of a year where we hopefully slow down and just notice God's goodness. And as a pastor, I was thinking about that and thinking about getting ready for Thanksgiving. And for me, one of the greatest places of thankfulness in my heart is that I have the privilege of being a pastor and specifically pastoring Shoreline Community Church. I feel utterly honored and humbled that I get to do what I do. Uh, I love this church, and it's just filled with people who are seeking to, to know who Jesus is or to grow in faith. And one of the things I love about our church is that it changes about every six to 12 months because we have so many people that transition in and out of this place. And so it's always a little different, but it's always the same. And it's always people who really do want to follow Jesus. And then we're on this journey of, of walking with Jesus together. So I want you to know uh, this Thanksgiving season. I'm thankful for you as a congregation and thankful to God that I get to do what I do being a pastor. And, and we're in this series uh, that Adam Barr started for us last week about, um, about kind of the, the longing and the searching of the human heart. And, and the, the reality is we live in a world with people who are trying to find meaning, purpose. You know, why, why am I alive? Why am I on this planet? What does my life mean? Is there, is there anything more than just the daily stuff that I kind of walk through. What is the real meaning of life? About 30 years ago, a band called U2 tried to answer that question. Uh, they had an album that came out called The Joshua Tree, and there was a song on that album that, that really grapples with this, this human heart and longing and desiring and trying to figure out why I'm on this planet. And so you might know that song. I'm going to read you some of the lines from the song and just hear the longing of the human heart. And after each of these lines, there's a refrain, and if you know it, you can kind of play it in your own mind as you listen. So here's one of the lines. I have climbed the highest mountains. I've run through the fields. And then after a few more lines, there, there's this refrain. Then I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls. And it goes on, but then there's this refrain of this longing of the human heart. Then this line, I have kissed honey lips, felt the healing of the fingertips. It burned like fire, this burning desire. But it says I'm still trying to find out what life really means. And then it gets a little bit spiritual. I believe when the kingdom comes, all the colors will bleed into one, bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. And then the refrain comes again in the song. And then it gets a little bit more spiritual. It kind of goes to Jesus. And it says, you broke the bonds. You loosed the chains. You carried the cross of my shame, of my shame. You know I believed it. And the refrain comes again. And a lot of you know what it is. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. There's this sense of, there's this, this cry in the song in so many people's lives where they're saying, you know, I, I strive for things, I look for things, I try to experience things, I do all these different things in life, and I get to the end of the day, and I put my head on the pillow, and I'm like, I, I, what does this all mean? Why am I here? Is there more to life than just grinding through another day and going to sleep at the end of another day? What is the real meaning of life? And then about 15 years later, after that album came out, another person 
address the same topic. There was a pastor, a pastor named Rick Warren, and he wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And the theme of the book was, what on earth am I here for? The whole book was just saying, why am I on planet earth? What does life mean? Interestingly, this book sold 30 million copies in the first five years. It was 15 years old now. 30 million copies in all kinds of different languages. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 90 weeks. Do you think that people are trying to figure out why they're on this planet, trying to find some purpose and some meaning? And a lot of people are, are kind of just, I, I still haven't found it. I still haven't figured it out. Well, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, uh, as only Jesus could, kind of answered the whole question. He didn't need a whole song. He didn't need a whole book. He answered all in one line. One verse from the Bible. I want to teach you today. I'm hoping that you can memorize <clears throat> this verse from the Bible today. Commit it to your memory and never forget it. It's Matthew 6, 33. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33. If you want to remember it, just 6, cut it in half, 3, 3. It's Matthew 6, 33. That's the reference. And here's what Jesus said. But seek first his kingdom. This is the kingdom of God. Seek first, above anything else, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Get the first thing first and the right thing right. Find out the purpose and meaning of life is really in seeking first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Earlier in the passage, Jesus is talking about, you know, you, you look for, you want clothing and you worry about your clothing, you worry about your food, just stuff of life. Not bad things, just live in life. He says, in light of all the things you strive after, at the end of the day, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. My first day of, uh, my first year of my ger uh, learning German, uh, Herr, Herr Reinhardt, my professor, said, students, how do we learn Deutsch? How do we learn German? And he would say, he said this many times through the class, senseless, mindless repetition, Senseless, mindless repetition. Say it with me. Senseless, mindless repetition. He said, that's how we learn German. If you're a DLI student, if you're learning a language, you learn there's lots of a process of just ingraining it in your mind. And, and, and so I want to say, I, I, I hope you can learn Matthew 6, today. I'm going to repeat it a lot. Because, because it's really, it just distills down all the searching and seeking of life. Where Jesus says, all those things might be good and they might be helpful and they might be valuable. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. What I'd like to do is I'd like to think together about what are some of the things that we seek after? What are some of those things that we probably don't even do it consciously, but we kind of, they end up, we put at the hub, at the center of our life. That's my meaning. That's my purpose. And we try to have our whole life revolve around this, but they don't work. They don't satisfy. They don't find true meaning. And I would say all of these things are what I, what I like to call nice, but not enough. So I'm going to talk about five things. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. Five things that are nice. They're not bad, but they're not enough to build your life on. They're not enough to make the meaning and the purpose of your life. They all start with the letter P. So if you're a note taker and you like all things with the same letter, you're going to have a great day today. So nice, number one, nice but not enough, possessions. Stuff, things. And the question becomes, what have I accumulated? Do you, do you, do you know that for many people, their meaning, their purpose in life, their entire center of their world is what they can get, what they can accumulate, and everything centers around getting the new thing, having the new thing, protecting the new thing, uh, you know, upgrading the new thing. It's just their life becomes about things. Now, again, it's not wrong to have things. That's not the point at all. But it is not wise to build your whole life around the stuff you amass and the stuff you collect. Because the truth of the matter is there's never enough. There's always some new other thing. And, and we can't find true meaning there. So I want to, with each of these different, uh, each of these nice but not enoughs, I want to give you three do's and one don't. Okay, three do's and one don't. So when it comes to accumulating things and possessions, do, number one, enjoy what you have. Enjoy the things that God gives you. The book of James, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from your heavenly Father, from the Father of heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift. So enjoy the good gifts that God's given to you. That's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy those gifts. Number two, Work hard if you want something else or something new. God celebrates work. Work's a gift. So work hard. If you're a young person and you want a car someday, and you say, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to start working, I'm going to start saving, that's great. 
If, if, you're, if you say, I'd, I'd love to own a home someday, which in this part of the world is really challenging, but you say, I want to do that, then, then work hard and strive. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Work hard and do your best and save and be responsible. That's great. So enjoy what you have, work hard. And then third, a third do, when it comes to possessions, be thankful to God for every good gift and share. Just say, God, thank you. It's Thanksgiving week. God, thank you for the good gifts you give. And God, if there, I can take what you've given me and share it with somebody else. Now, I want to do that. This last week, we had our organic outreach intensive and organic outreach conference. And we had guests come in from different parts of the world and different parts of the country. It's expensive to rent a hotel here. So a lot of people from Shoreline actually took their homes and opened up part of their home and said, you can stay here. God, thank you for my home. I'll share it with someone else. That's the spirit. You know? that's, that's just saying, God, thank you for the good gifts. But they're so good, I want to share them with others. So, so when it comes to your possessions, they're not bad. And when it, but, 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 you know, so do enjoy them, do work hard, do be thankful and share. Here's your don't. And listen closely. Don't base your life meaning on what you have. Don't do that. Because you will just struggle all through life. Because things come and go and, and monetary systems change. And if you build your life around the stuff of this world, it will not fully satisfy. There's more than that. If you keep building your life around that, you'll keep saying, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But, there, but there's more. So here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. Nice but not enough. Popularity. Here's the question. Who likes me? Don't, you know, we can build our lives around thinking, do enough people like me, feel good about me? For some people, their life comes apart if anybody doesn't like them. And, 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 and whether, this, whether these are likes on social media or I like you because I'm your friend, whatever it is, be careful. So, so three do's and one don't when it comes to relationships and connecting with people. And sometimes we think your know, popularity, oh, only junior high kids worry about that. That's for high school. No, no, that's for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 year old adults. We still care, right? So who likes me? Here, number one, here's a do. Build great relationships. Boy, pour into relationships. There's only a couple things that are gonna last for eternity. That's God and people. And so pour into people. That's, that's incredibly valuable. Build great relationships. Invest in them. Number two, do. Celebrate life with family and friends. Just celebrate life. Enjoy life. Many of you will get together with family and friends this Thursday. Don't fight. You know, <laughs> Yeah, get together for the yearly, you know, brawl. Uh, don't. Just, just enjoy family. Enjoy friends as a gift from God. Number three, enjoy Christian friends. Nurture Christian friendships. Jump into a growth group. Come to a class at Shoreline. Build some new. Get to know some Christian people and build Christian friendships. Build great relationships. Celebrate life with family and friends. Enjoy Christian friends. Here's your don't. Don't let your life meaning be set by how many people like you. Don't make the meaning of your life contingent upon and built upon how many people like you, or particularly that everybody likes you. For some, for some people, they, they simply cannot, um, <coughs> excuse me, for some people, they cannot live with a discontinuity of somebody not liking them. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for over 30 years. So I learned years ago if you pastor a church of 10 people, there's a good chance somebody doesn't like you. If you pastor a church with hundreds or thousands of people, there's a really good chance someone doesn't like you. And I was reminded about that this week. Um, I've been a pastor for 30 years, and I was reminded this week that not everybody likes me. Um, over my 30 years, you're already anticipating, aren't you? Yeah, write your own script here. <laughs> um, so, so for 30 years, I've been a pastor. I've got a handful of times where somebody has written a really mean, nasty, attack kind of a letter. I mean, just... just you know, just where they just kind of come after me or my, or, or my wife or that you know, kind of thing. And, and so this, a couple days ago, I, I got the most vicious, dishonest, meanest letter I've gotten in over 30 years of ministry. And the worst thing of all, it wasn't signed. Which is like a sniper attack. And then you can't even talk to the person, right? And so, I mean, really, you know, it comes out of nowhere. Well, <coughs> guess what I do as a pastor if I get a letter that's not signed? I throw it away, right? Here's the problem. They didn't send the letter to me. They sent it to some of our church leaders about me and, and also went after my wife. I said, no, this same last service, everybody's like me, uh, Sherry, oh, like, um, but, but they, you know, it, it just, and it's interesting, um, they, the, this person accused my wife 
of working for the church just to take people's, take people's offering money, take their money. My wife has a, a, a bachelor's in education, a master's in theology with an emphasis on spiritual formation and discipleship. And she's, she works 30 to 50 hours a week. She's never been paid a penny by Shoreline. She's on our staff, and she works like a staff person. She doesn't get paid a penny. And they attacked her for trying to, you know, it, it, it was just one of these things. And so so here, here's the point. Here's the point. If, if my life was about everybody liking me, and if I couldn't function if someone didn't like me, right now I'd be doing one of two things. I'd be at home crying, which clearly I'm not, or I'd be tracking this person down, which I won't do because I'm a pastor, right? That would be bad, right? You're all, you, yeah, that would be, I'm telling you, that would be bad. Um, <laughs> Some of you are like, no, find them. Um, <coughs> so anyways, um, but don't let your life meaning be, be set by how many people like you. If, if you, if you. if the hub of your life is I need to be liked, you will never find peace and satisfaction. But I, I'll tell you how you will find peace and satisfaction. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you. He'll take care of the rest. The third, nice but not enough, passion. Passion. So many people in our world today, they are just looking for and longing for that person. I need someone who will love me. It's the man who's looking for that perfect woman who will love him and walk alongside him. He can put all of his emotional, relational eggs in that one basket and she will make him happy. Or, it's, or, or, or it's, it's that woman who's looking for that perfect man, that, that Prince Charming. She's, been, she's watched all the Disney films growing up, you know, and she's looking, for, she's looking for Prince Charming. And by the way, he doesn't exist. My wife already married him. No, that's not true. That's not true. But it's, he, doesn't, he doesn't exist, right? You could ask my wife, I am not Prince Charming. No, there, and here's the reality. If you're looking for that perfect person to make you, you complete me, to make you whole, they don't exist. But, but the gift of passion and relationship is a gift from God. So here's three do's and one don't when it comes to, to passion. Who will love me? Here's the do. Do enjoy romance in God's plan. God, you know, God, when God made the heavens and the earth, read the book of Genesis, when God says God made the heavens and the earth and he put a man and a woman together and he said, be fruitful and multiply. That's God's plan. That's God's design. God performed the first marriage. God brought together the first covenantal union. Praise God for that. That's a good gift. So, so say, God, thank you for this gift and rejoice in that. Do, if you're married, love your spouse well. If you are married, pour into that relationship. Love your spouse. Serve your spouse. Bless your spouse. Invest in that relationship. Absolutely. Do delight in the gift of intimacy. There is something wonderful about the way God has made us. As a matter of fact, I'm right now in my morning devotions, I've been reading uh, uh, in Psalms and Proverbs. I'm kind of doing a study. I'm, do, I'm just kind of para, uh, putting together uh, each, each Psalm with each proverb by number. So uh, two days ago, I was in chapter five of Psalms and Proverbs. And I'm just reading the scriptures and journaling and just kind of asking God to teach me. And so I got to, I got to Proverbs uh, chapter five. And, remember, and, and, and right now, my wife is actually speaking at an international summit of leaders in the Philippines. And so she's far away. And I'm reading chapter five of Proverbs, and it's really romantic. Matter of fact, younger kids, you might want to, actually, in the ancient Jewish world, boys weren't allowed to read some of these portions of, of, of Ecclesiastes and of Song of Songs and of Proverbs until they were a certain age because it's kind of, so if you got young kids, if you want to plug their ears, you can because I'm going to read the Bible. Okay, prepare yourself. Um, <laughs> In Proverbs 5, and it's this picture of water, and water in this passage is a picture of, of sexual intimacy. It's a, it's a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage enjoying the beauty of that relationship. And here's what's written. Remember, water is intimacy. Okay, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Be faithful to your spouse, right? Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares? No. Ne let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. And then it kind of heats up. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all of your paths. This passage says that, that, that intimacy in marriage is an incredible gift from God, and my wife is thousands of miles away. So pray for me, because I miss her, and I keep reading the Bible. And, um, but but, but here, here's the deal. 
when it comes to passion, enjoy romance as God's plan. Uh, love your spouse well. Delight in the gift of intimacy. But listen closely. Here's the don't. Don't make your marriage the central reason you live. Do not base your life, if you're married, on your husband and wife. Do not do that because, men, if you base your, your life on this woman, as wonderful as she, she may love Jesus, she may be a wonderful woman, but she's not perfect. And you put too much strain and stress that my life revolves around you. Women, do not base your life on, on some man that you may know or may meet somebody that, that, that he's perfect, he's gonna meet all my needs. We will let each other down. We're fractured, frail people. But you wanna have a great marriage, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Become the person he wants you to be. And all these things will be given to you. Then the rest begins to make sense because your life is hubbed around and built around and based on seeking God's kingdom and God's glory and God's righteousness. The number four, nice but not enough, is your profession. Oh, so many people in our world, their whole life is their job. Their, their purpose, their meaning in life is their job and succeeding in their job. And then you watch people when that job is gone. It's like their whole life purpose just seems to evaporate. They're not sure where to go with their life or what to do because they built everything around that. Now, is a job a good gift? Yes, it's a gift from God. But just don't build your life around it. So here's three do's when it comes to your profession and to what you do. Number one, seek to be great at what you do. Whatever you do, be the absolute best that you can be at that. If you're a Christian, you should be your absolute best at whatever it is you do. I called the doctor the other day. I need to go in and get a little thing on my, some skin on my ear looked at. I've had skin stuff for years. And, and so I called, and new doctor, the receptionist, was so kind and helpful and clear and professional. After about a two-minute conversation, I'm thinking, I would hire this person for almost anything. I was so, you know, have you ever had that? Like you go into a restaurant, you get a server who's just, they're just on and they have the right attitude and they work hard or you're going, you know, it could be in the medical profession or educational world or the military, whatever, you know, where you meet somebody, they, they just, they do what they do with excellence. It's a beautiful thing to see. And I, I really believe as, as Christians, work, I believe work is a gift from God. Matter of fact, in the Bible, in Genesis, before sin ever entered the world, God actually said, Adam and Eve, get to work. Tend the garden, take care of it. Work is not a curse. What happened, when the curse came, it was the pain of labor that came in. But labor and working is actually a gift from God. And so as a Christian, as a Christian, seek to be great at what you do. Do your best. And second, the second do, show God's presence in your work life. Whatever you do, just say, Lord, let the presence of Jesus shine through me. In some places you can be overt about it. In some places you have to be very quiet and careful. But Lord Jesus, let your light and your love shine through me. Let me show the presence of Jesus. And then the third do. Earn what you need to provide for loved ones. Can I say that sometimes a job may not be epic and exciting. Sometimes it's just a paycheck to take care of your family. And I think we live in a time where for a lot of people, everybody wants every day of life to be this incredible adventure. And sometimes work is just hard work and you do it the best for Jesus and you shine the light of Jesus, but sometimes you just do your work and work hard. But, but do those things. But here's the don't. Don't define who you are or what you're worth by the job you do. Do not let your job define who you are or what you're worth, because then you will all of a sudden say, I'm not sure who I am or what I'm worth. But what you should do is exactly what Jesus said. I hope you have it by now. But seek first his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. Live for him, and all these things will be given to you. The other things fall into place and make sense. You may still have to work at them, but they make sense when you have the core right in your life. Seeking Jesus, seeking his kingdom, seeking his glory. And a fifth, nice but not enough, is play. What have I experienced? We've become a very experience-oriented culture where we need to kind of post on social media all the exciting things I do so you can look and say, wow, you have the most you know, amazing, exciting life I've ever seen. And people are impressed by that. But here's the reality. Um, what you experience doesn't define you. You can't be captured with a few pictures and a few statements. There, there's more to life than that. But, but also, God, I think God would say, enjoy life and enjoy your experiences. So here's three do's and one don't when it comes to about you know, play and how it fits into your life. Do explore and enjoy people and places. Explore and enjoy the people around you and the places you go. And thank the Lord for those opportunities. If you get to travel, wonderful. If you can't travel much, you're okay. You live in Monterey County and the whole world is here. It is. 
And at Shoreline Church, we have, you know, if, if we have teachers from the Defense Language Institute. We have people here from the military, for business, for resorts. The whole world seems to flow in and out of this area. Meet people, talk with them, enjoy them. People that are different than you. And, and have conversations. But, but in, you know, in, meet and enjoy people. Explore life. That's great. A second do. Find hobbies and activities you like and take delight in them. Find things that are really fun and enjoy them. I believe that God wants us to have joy in our lives. God's the author of joy. So that's great. Have fun. Three, the third do. Rediscover the simple pleasures right where you are. There's simple pleasures all around us, like parks and beaches and hikes and backgammon. <laughs> um, my wife and I play backgammon like five nights a week. Now, the last week I've been playing by myself. I keep winning, but it's kind of boring. Um, no, I haven't been playing by myself. But, but my wife and I, like four or five nights a week, we play backgammon. You can play a game in like five minutes or 10 minutes, or we, or we play cribbage sometimes. So we just have these little games we play, and we talk, and we visit, and we play little games. And it's a blast. And, and, and just and around here, we've got some of the best national parks in the world within like 15 minutes of us. Some of those beautiful beaches in the world within 15 minutes of us. We've got hiking trails. They're mind-blowing. I mean, it's all, all these things within a half an hour of where we're sitting right here. And all those things are free. Explore, enjoy, have fun, praise God. But here's the don't when it comes to play and life being about what I've experienced. Don't measure the value of your life based on how many things you check off your personal bucket list. You know, bucket list is the list of things you want to do before you kick the bucket, before you die. And there's a movie a while back with, with, uh, with uh, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman where they, you know, they get to fly on planes and race cars and do all these amazing things. But at the end of the movie, they're both dead. They're gone. And if that's all there is, if that's it, then no matter what you enjoyed on your bucket list, you, you, you haven't enjoyed what lasts forever. But Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things. He'll, he'll give those in due time. He'll put the pieces together. So the bottom line is we have to understand that there's real, substantial, and etern eternal meaning in life. Is there anything to give me hope? The answer is yes. It's Jesus. And he needs to become the hub, the center of our lives and our homes and our passions and our desires. And he will add all the other things. And the other things will make sense when we have Jesus in his rightful place. The problem is we put other things in the middle and put Jesus on the side. And it all wobbles out of control. And you get Jesus in the middle. And he makes everything else fit. So in Christ, if you're a note taker in your bulletin, there's a place to write down a couple of thoughts. In Christ, you can belong to a forever family. In Christ, relationships last forever. It's an amazing thought that we will be with Jesus and his family, his people in heaven forever and ever. Romans 12, 5 says this. So in Christ, we, though many different people, form one body, that's the church, and each member belongs to all the others. We actually belong to each other within the church. We are a family of God. Some years ago, Sherry and I went to a, a conference. We were actually presenting at a conference down in San Diego. And they had an author's dinner. And Sherry and I got seated next to this guy named Calvin Miller. Some of you may know the name Calvin Miller. Many of you won't even know who that is. But at that time in my life, this was probably 20 years ago, um, I'd read probably seven or eight of Calvin's books. I'd been so influenced by him as a pastor and as a leader. And I just love this guy's writing and so respected. I'd never met him. I get sat next to him. So we kind of chatted during dinner and he's really friendly, just as gracious as you would think he would be. And, and, and then at the end of the meal, he said, hey, what, would you and Sherry like to have breakfast? I don't have plans for breakfast tomorrow. Do you want to have breakfast together? I'm not a real breakfast guy, but it's Calvin Miller. It's like one of my heroes. And so I'm like, I would love to have breakfast. And at the end of breakfast, he said, hey, do you want to have breakfast tomorrow? And we had breakfast every morning of the conference. At the end of the conference, he said, are you coming back to the conference next year? And we said, yeah, we come every year. He said, can we do breakfasts together? <laughs> All of them. And we're like, we'd love to. And we just fell in love with this guy. He's just this godly, wonderful man. And every time we were together, he'd say, he'd say to us, you gotta come out to Nebraska and meet my wife. She would love you and you would love her. And we just, you know, it's one of those things, we keep getting invited, but we just never did it. And last year, Calvin passed away. And I was talking with Sherry, and I said to Sherry, you know, we never got out to see Calvin and to meet his wife. And my wife says to me, oh, we'll meet her. And we'll see Calvin again, too. And it just reminded me, yeah, we're gonna have forever to be with God's family. That's a good gift. 
When you, build, when you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, you have these relationships that aren't just coming and going. They are forever. You're part of a forever family. What a gift that is. In Christ, you can find your mission. What's your mission in life? In, in, in Jeremiah, uh, in Jeremiah 29, um, verse 11, Jeremiah is actually writing to, uh, to God's people, and it's an interesting time in history because they're gonna actually go into exile, and he's talking about after they go into exile that one day they're gonna come back out God has this sort of long-term complex plan for his people. But he writes this. I know, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He's, he's saying, I know my plan for you. You may not see it right now, but I have a plan for you that's going to be amazing and beautiful. And I really believe that plan, that, that mission that God has, is when he fills you by his spirit, he pours through you and blesses others. When I became a Christian, I was 15 years old. I knew right away I had a passion to teach God's word, even though I'd never had a Bible. I was given a Bible, started reading. I thought, I want to teach other people what the Bible says. And I knew I wanted to tell people about Jesus. That was my mission. For years before I became a pastor, years before anybody told me you could do it as a job, I just was teaching the Bible and I was telling people about Jesus because that's my mission. That's my passion. That's my heart. My wife, Sherry, is in the Philippines right now, speaking at an international summit of leaders about prayer. Because that's her mission. That's her passion. God has called her to teach on prayer. And she sent me a text the other day. Uh, she said, I just got invited to go speak on prayer in Lebanon. And then I got another text. I've been invited to speak on prayer in, I don't remember the country, in Africa somewhere. And that, that's, that's God's call for her. But it's not just those big things out there. It's right where we are. Like right now, there are people on mission right now who are in the tide pools where all the little babies are. And who are upstairs in the cove and the, light, the lighthouse room with all the children. And there are people, they aren't paid. There are people just like you who love children and they have a mission to, to pray for children and to teach children about Jesus. And so they're up there pouring into your children and your grandchildren because they are on mission for Jesus. We have a whole group of people here at Shoreline that are part of our lay counseling ministry. Do you know we have offices in Monterey, not here on campus because if people want to do counseling, say, you can go there, you're not gonna have to bump into anybody on staff. And I think, I think it's $5 you pay for a registration fee and you get six to eight sessions of counseling by a, lay, a trained lay counselor. They went through training. They've been certified. They're not a licensed therapist. They're a lay counselor. But they, they pray with people, encourage people in faith. Anyone in church at Shoreline can go to them anytime. And if any friends you have that aren't part of Shoreline, you can send there. And all these people do it absolutely for free. You know why? They are on mission. That's their passion. That's their gifting. They're, God is filling them and flowing through them. And, and, I, and I, when you know Jesus, he says, I'll show you your mission. It's, it's, it's something where I pour through you and bless the world around you. In Christ, you can see your goal, your aspiration, what it is that God wants for you to become. And it's, and it's very simple, but it's also very complex. Here's the goal. For any person who comes to the cross and accepts Jesus, if you're a Christian, this is your life goal. If you're not yet a Christian, you become a Christian, this will become your life goal. Here it is. To become more like Jesus. Jesus. To love like Jesus, to serve like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to live like Jesus. Listen to what, listen to what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. Therefore, if, any was in, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. As a Christian, you become a new person and God's transforming you. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says this. I love this passage. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Wow. You are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you and you're becoming more like Jesus. The apostle Paul says it like this. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He says, I want you to walk with me. And learn from my example, but only for one reason. I'm following the example of Jesus. That should be how parents live with their kids. Follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. That's how grandparents should be. Follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. That's how friends should be. This, this is God's desire, that we become more like Jesus. And how do you do that? Well, you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You put that first. I am super excited for 2018. We have, we have the whole, we worked as a team, we have the whole year laid out with what we're teaching from God's word. We're starting the year with a series uh, basically called A Healthy Life. 
And we're going to look at how to have healthy relationships, how to have a healthy spiritual life, how to have a healthy body. We're going to walk through what a healthy life looks like. Then we're going to go into a whole series here at Shoreline, basically on how to become more like Jesus. What does it look like? How, how do I know if I'm growing more to be like Jesus? And we're going to look at that as a congregation and grow together. I am absolutely thrilled and excited. I hope and pray uh, you'll be praying and asking God to use that series to grow us all into the image of Jesus. And finally, in Christ, you can find your destiny. Your eternal destiny is found in Jesus Christ when you seek him first and seek his kingdom. Here's what we read in Revelation chapter 21, verses three to four. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. That's the hope of Jesus. That's the hope of heaven. And when you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness... That's the road you walk on. The human soul longs to know what is life all about. And there's all these other things that aren't bad things. But if you put them at the center of your life, it doesn't work. Seek first his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. And let him put all the other pieces in place. Would you stand with me? I want to invite the worship team to come and join us. I want to give you a word of blessing. The team's going to just kind of send us off with a song. And then I'm going to come back up and, and just give you a word of blessing. But I want to pray as we stand together. And, and if you're able to stand, let's stand. And just let's ask the Lord to work in our lives in a fresh new way. Oh, God, we thank you that you've given us wonderful things. That we have possessions and we have great people in our lives. And there's passion and there's all these different things that are good gifts. But, Lord, here's our prayer Help us to not build our lives on things that were never meant to sustain a life, that were never meant to be our meaning and the core of who we are. And Lord, help us to learn what it means to seek first above all things your kingdom, to seek first above all things your righteousness. And then, Lord, would you put the pieces of our life together? Would you move in our lives? And now.